minutes past the top of the hour we still have about 50 minutes to talk to you steve ogola is already seated here but i want to interest you in something before i leave. look at this this is deep split in ruto's party there's a division based on the election that uh, grassroots election that is supposed to take place for the party officials later on in december that's the 9th of december there's a split because the president allied members of uda want it on the 9th regarding a shagwa allied leaders want it postponed up to next year Read about that story on the standard front page talks about it. It's all about that split at the party. That's not the only story. Biden backs Israel on Gaza explosion, a big story unfolding all over the world, not only in Kenya. A big change is to expect as universal health law is signed tomorrow by President Ruto, who I bet is somewhere in the clouds coming back to the country after the three-day visit in China. Well, grab your copy of the Bold newspaper. As I always say, only the Bold speak the truth. Steve Ogola, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kim. Big story unfolding out of Mavoko since last week on Friday. I know you as a lawyer, someone interested in conveyancing. You've been looking at this story. So paint the picture for us as a lawyer where you're sitting. Where did the rain start beating them? Because I don't believe, for example, that President Uhuru Kenyatta's time knew about this. Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly after one year of uh, President Ruto's uh, win, then there's something happening and Mavoko residents are being thrown out and their houses are being destroyed. Not even, it's a forced eviction and destruction is not being demolished. Paint a picture for us essentially where this started. The first one, can we must uh, empathize with uh the very vulnerable Kenyans who lost their properties in Mavoko. Um, first of all, the manner in which that eviction happened does not commend itself with the provisions of Article 43 of the Constitution. Remember 10 years ago, Justice Lenaola, when he was still at the High Court in Satro's Ayuma case, he said that even if, where evictions and demolitions are to happen, they need to comply with the United Nations guidelines on demolitions 2007 mm -hmm. and the United Nations uh, Committee on Socioeconomic Rights, General Comment Number 7, which also pro provides for guidelines. Among those guidelines for demolition is that you not only need to give people sufficient notice, but you also need to pay attention mm -hmm. to where they are re re relocating to. And I think there was a bit of lapse that 10 years later, mm -hmm. uh, even if people acquired that land fraudulently, as we will discuss later, I think we needed to pay more attention mm -hmm. to a more humane manner of eviction and giving people multiple chances to salvage whatever they can from their properties and not just bringing down, you know, as, as your newspaper says, um, just demolishing properties, yeah, mm -hmm. that are people have invested in heavily and therefore they have nowhere to start from. But having said so, the <coughs> cases of land fraud in Kenya has played out in Mavoko, these are commonplace. Okay. And sometimes uh, we want to empathize as you have done with the innocent purchasers. But we've also questioned really to what extent should you take responsibility mm -hmm. as a purchase of a property? What happened to due diligence? Mm -hmm. Because due diligence as we know it must take place at three levels you must be sure that you have in your possession the original title. Okay. Especially where subdivision is happening, mm -hmm. subdivision happens from a mother title. Yeah. You have to be sure that you have in your possession a copy of the original title and you've done a search on it. So that the person selling mm -hmm. the land, actually the owners of that, the owners of this property, the name corresponds with what is in the original title. And then you also have to do some physical visit on the site. Yeah. Because sometimes, Ken, what happens is, the registered owner of this property may not be the same as the reputed owner. What is the difference? <clears throat> I mean, we have worked in, let's say, in the CBD, and people have pointed that this building is owned by so-and-so. Yeah. And you have known this property to be owned by so-and-so without seeing the title. That The, repu the reputed owner mm -hmm. could actually be someone who has owned that property for a long time, but there was fraudulent transfer. Okay. So if I give you a title, that shows the properties in my name, you need to visit that property to reconcile the name on the title with the name on the ground. Because sometimes the reputed owner on the ground, people could tell you neighbors that mm. this property is owned in, by someone else. In your Steve. Yeah, uh -huh. but, but the title you're looking at, is in, but it's also important mm. to go beyond that and also take that uh, LR number, mm -hmm. insert it on Kenya law, mm -hmm. do a common search, mm -hmm. it could surprise you. You could get orders that can indicate that the matter is a, there's a pending dispute, mm -hmm. which could be a red flag. If you're buying property that has a pending court case, mm -hmm. 
you may want to go slow on that. Wait, you should, just taking the LR number and putting in Kenya law, it's if able to it, yes. produce if there's a case yes, attached to that property. Yes, if there's a case, okay. it will generate that case. Because if there's a case, most most of the time in land cases, and I think this is the kind of innovation that we see only in land cases, mm. most of the time because the court needs to preserve the suit property, the court always issues preservatory orders. Okay. Let's say interim orders of injunction, stopping any further transaction on that land during the pendency of the case. So you may not know that the case is in court because they, when, when someone files a case in court, they don't need to announce it. But if you take the land registration number and you insert it on, and Kenyans can access, if you have a smartphone, yeah, just, just go to Kenya Law and just put that number there. Mm -hmm. Then you press search. You could be surprised if it pops up, it could give you the history of that litigation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you look at the long title, it could show you how this property has changed hands. Because sometimes you have a title that has been inserted. Unfortunately, in instances of fraud, it usually most of the time involves some corrupt land officials at the registry. Okay. Who say, I'm selling this property to Ken. Mm -hmm. I know he'll come do a search. Kindly generate a search certificate that corresponds Correct. with my name. You know, because I was about to ask Steve, you said three levels yes, yes. of due diligence. Yes, yes. The third level uh, surprised me because I thought the third level you will say, mm -hmm. go to land and verify. No, no. That's what third, I thought no, you would no, say. No. You see, that part of the search, mm -hmm. Kenyans are becoming more vigilant. And it's, yes, it's always recommended to not just, when you do the apostle search, is far much better. If you do a physical search, it's even much better than just doing an online search on our disaster platform, for instance, because a physical search will give you the history of that property. But even where fraudsters are clever and have altered, interfered with the, the data of the Minister of Lands, if you go a step further and search on that land registration number, on Kenya law, mm -hmm. you could get the history of that land insofar as cases around it are concerned. Mm -hmm. And that could disclose a red flag. Okay. That's the starting point. Yes. You know, or, or, already someone is telling me here that the, the amount of information Steve is giving you could cost you a lot of money if you went to his law firm. The more reason <laughs> that people should watch yeah, this. Sure, so yeah, sure. that is pre, I want to buy land and I will delve into that. But seven years ago alfred mm. mutua then governor machakos yes, just yes. having served probably three years as yes, governor yes. Mm. stood at a platform and the video has been circulating mm. and gave a warning about that land mm. at the river is in machakos county right yes, yes. and no one heeded now i want you to tell me how do we have a caution against the land and people still go and buy that land when you're talking about due diligence, another level that I would think is I get a lawyer. I have a lawyer, but I have a lawyer of my lawyer. Mm -hmm. So usually when I give a lawyer work, I would want to follow up. So I, I, I get two lawyers. So I tell the other lawyer, there's work here, but please follow up to see how it's being done. Mm -hmm. So due diligence, part of it, because not every person has a, the capacity to verify if land is genuine. Mm -hmm. And even during the transfers, mm -hmm. lawyers are involved in converting. How comes these people still get through with fraudulent purchases? I think there are two reasons that can explain this kind of scenario. The first one is the false sense of security that comes in numbers. Okay. When land is being subdivided and it's being sold to a large group of people. Ah, to Kowengi. To Kowengi, so yes. you always feel like uh, nothing can go wrong. And then you can let your guard down and then when something goes wrong, then when you trace your step back, every person who has ever been caught in a land fraud case, if you speak to them, they'll make some honest admission of some lapses on their part. But insofar as legal counsel is concerned, sometimes it may not necessarily be a problem of lack of due diligence on the part of counsel. Mm -hmm. It could actually be the kind of pressure clients bring to lawyers. You know, if you come with a, with a settled determination to buy property and you tell your lawyer that, listen, I have identified this property We've agreed on the, on, the, on the purchase price. There's a standard sale agreement. Yeah. The title deed is ready. Subdivision has been done. As long as once I sign the sale agreement and then the, the transfer will be done. Sometimes lawyers have to weigh and then just decide, you know what? I will assume. But I think there's some ethical obligation on the part of ethical and professional obligation on the part of counsel to advise a client who seems to be in a rush mm -hmm. of the consequences of overlooking or sidestepping some of these critical due diligence processes. For instance, no lawyer should progress to the level of negotiating the terms of the sale agreement mm -hmm. until he's absolutely certain, as counsel on record, that this title is clean. Yeah. 
And where you have retained legal counsel, a lawyer needs to know that other than doing the, the search on who's the registered owner, a site visit, which many lawyers sometimes do not do, mm -hmm. a site visit the property to confirm that the registered owner corresponds with the reputed owner in a further search on Kenya law to be absolutely certain that you have ruled out any possibility for mischief. Okay. A, a lawyer needs to satisfy himself with that requirement before then he can go into drafting the terms of the sale agreement. But again also, I have seen instances, in, for instance, personally, I declined quite a number of these land transactions mm -hmm. if a client comes with a fixated mind. Because I tell them, listen, the LSK conditions for sale of land 2015 are very clear. Mm -hmm. Deposit of 10, is 10%, 90% upon successful transfer of the title to the purchaser. Okay. Which means you can mitigate your, lo your losses if you pay 10% deposit and the balance of 90% of the purchase price is held in a stakeholder account or in the client account and you are the, the vendor, the, the purchaser's advocate, then issues an irrevocable professional undertaking. undertaking yeah. That I have the balance of the purchase price, mm -hmm. as soon as the title is transferred to my client's name, we will release it. I mean, that should, be, that should give the vendor, the seller, the kind of assurance because it's as good as having a banker's check. Because yeah. once you have it, you have your money. money. Yeah. If there's a problem at the level of transfer, then you can be able to arrest it and your client need not to lose money mm -hmm. because your professional undertaking only relates to upon successful transfer of that title. Okay. So I think it's about the, in enhancing the level of vigilance. I think in uh, Ken in Chinua Chebe, there's a story that when the, he talks about when the bird land, when the hunter, the hunter learned to shoot without yeah, missing, yeah. the bird learned to fly without patching. So I think the level of vigilance that is needed of land transactions needs to go up to match the kind of fraud and sophisticated fraud that we witness, if only to reduce the kind of hardship Kenyans fall into when the land that they purchased turn out to be regular. I'm just wondering, Steve, um, who bears the greatest responsibility? Who bears the greatest responsibility when I am purchasing land, I'm purchasing property? Who bears the greatest responsibility? Because if you are a, a fraudulent person, you will not care. In fact, you enjoy if there's no due diligence because you get away with that fraudulent sale. But then who bears the responsibility? Is it the seller at that point? For example, let's, let's use at the River Portland, cement land. Who had the greatest, the person who would win to the thousands mm. of Kenyans to buy or the Kenyans who did not do the due diligence? Because I'm heading to a point where mm. now, do they deserve a court case? That's where I'm heading to. Well, I think the first question or the, or the more urgent question of uh, relevance now is mm -hmm. whether they had legal counsel. To be honest, Ken, if you have instructed legal counsel to oversee, and you're paying a lawyer to oversee this transaction, there's the presumption of competence and diligence. And you'd expect at the very minimum that a conveyancer would understand the necessary, the prerequisites, the prerequisite steps that are needed to safeguard your title. If a lawyer has done his part, he cannot be blamed. Okay. I think what lawyers now need to know or to do, if a client seems to come with a stubborn attitude or a settled determination to purchase property while bypassing due diligence requirements, it's better for them to sign then a deed of indemnity, indemnifying the firm and the lawyer. Just in case. Just in case, because yeah. if you come and tell me, I'm, I want to do a cash purchase. Mm. That's the fixed mind you're talking about. Yes, mm -hmm. I want to do a cash purchase, I'm paying all at once, because I'm going to lose this property if I don't pay it all at once, mm -hmm. and I can see a red flag there, could you please sign here that you understand the risks of a cash purchase? Should anything go wrong during the transfer, you might end up losing your money, and I do not want someone to blame the legal counsel. Then maybe I'm so done with the, the, the transaction. Yeah. But it's always important for those transactions that I've gone through, because sometimes you'll, someone will ask, well, for he is building scenarios when someone about the steps that need to be taken when buying land, but I took all those steps and still and somebody still said mm -hmm. my title is fake. I think what happens when these cases go to court mm -hmm. where someone is evidencing a parallel title, which means in respect of the same property, you have more than one title. It's important that Kenyans know that where more than one person is claiming ownership of that property and they have parallel titles the process matters. Okay. That the case 
will be the, the fate of that case will lie on whoever is able to prove that they got their land through the right process. For instance, the Supreme Court said recently, Kenyans who buy land, well, well, Kenyans who are buying land from people who have been allocated land, so there's a big risk there because an allotment letter, for instance, mm -hmm. does not confer title. To you, it doesn't. Why don't just wait for someone with an allotment letter mm -hmm. to get the title in his name title, yeah. and then sell it to you? Mm -hmm. Again, if you are buying land and you have missed a step, for instance, there's a sale agreement, you've signed a sale agreement which now binds you to pay the, the, the purchase price within mm -hmm. the stipulated period and you've not paid attention whether this title is clean or not. Because I've seen instances where someone looks presentable, very organized. Most of these fraudsters, they appear believable and they look dignified and their families and children. In fact, I've seen there's a pattern in Kisumu particularly because I've dealt with those cases where people come to you and tell you, you know what, we are part of this family. We've lost our, maybe Muse is dead. We need money for school fees for the children. We don't object to the sale. Mm -hmm. Then part of the family members purportedly sell this land pending succession. Then once you sign the sale agreement and you pay the money, another section of family members say then no. come up and say no no we are no, not no, selling no. this land we are objecting we never gave consent so i think people need to understand the nuances the way fraud is becoming prevalent land fraud cases is becoming prevalent i think i would suggest if you're going to buy property that is valued at five hundred thousand and above it makes sense to negotiate legal fee with a lawyer and pass the responsibility of due diligence and professional responsibility to a lawyer. Okay. And stick... Without a letter of indemnity. Yes. <laughs> stick to the legal advice yeah. that a lawyer gives you. Yes. And if you want to bypass that advice, mm -hmm. we'd encourage fellow lawyers to make sure that they are indemnified from any kind of blame mm -hmm. that, may come, that, that yes. might come after. Okay. Very interesting perspective. But I want to know, there's this question of where was the government when these buildings were coming up? Why now? I mean, I'm just looking at recourse for these people. I mean, the buildings, there must be someone who approved these buildings. Who was he? You know, the approval, approval of the building plans presupposes that the title was, a, was, 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 was procured. There's not due diligence at that point of the no. approval. The, you see, the people, like, let's say the city managers mm -hmm. or, the, or the, the, the land liaison committees, the people that are approving, including NEMA that are approving this, you know, NEMA license to approve the construction of these properties, you have there's a presumption there that you acquired your title the right way and it's not in their business to question your title unless there's a lawful excuse for it mm -hmm. so if i present a title and say this is my title i bought it this time i don't think it's the business to go back and say business you, go back and trace, you know the right way okay but it's mm -hmm. your duty mm -hmm. to make sure that before you put in a lot of money in a project such as what you've seen in mavoko that you pay attention to the process leading to your title. Okay. That and process, that process can only be midwife by a competent. It should be midwife by a competent lawyer. Mm -hmm. Well, in some instances, people can people can process land purchase on their own because the requirement for buying land is that the agreement must be in writing. Mm -hmm. It must be signed. Mm -hmm. It must be witnessed. I saw a lot from my dad. I mean, those things signed yes. a lot with the amount of money. Each time yes. he adds money, they come and add Hapochini and say, "Pay uh, three hundred thousand, mm. paid one fifty, mm. paid yeah. Mm. So yes. So some of some of these disputes, I think, because they revolve around disputes revolve around payment or non-payment, whether the sale agreement is enforceable or not, whether this title was acquired was procured the right way or not. Mm -hmm. I think bottom line, looking at the increased cases of fraud. We can only overemphasize the need to have a lawyer preside over land transactions. And I've already said, mm -hmm. if you have a lawyer that you've paid money to preside over your land transaction to guide you through the process, then you shift the responsibility to that legal counsel. Mm -hmm. So the lawyer then must pay attention to the prerequisite steps that are necessary before they clear this transaction, and before they give it the go ahead to purchase that property. Yeah. Okay. So we found ourselves in this problem. Mm. The houses are being demolished. I want to play a little bit of politics. Mm. Um, from the top of your head, both president and deputy president promised that this will not happen. Mm. Let me play some politics. Why is it happening? 
or it's beyond their control. I remember the deputy president a few days ago over the weekend said he was not aware of what was happening. The government was not aware. The, the county commission was not aware of what was happening. They are uh, security agencies that left another county to come and ensure that it doesn't happen. And there was a, um, um, there was a directive that they must report to uh, the authorities in that location because they can't. It's, it's just now, the throwing us. Now, politics could, in this particular case, politics could go either way. Mm -hmm. in the way of stopping the eviction, why also taking political responsibility, why those evictions were, were, were not stopped. Also, in the way of facilitating those evictions because there was a court order that then facilitated these forced evictions. There's a finding that this, this property, the people who are in this will obtain their titles by fraud. And therefore, in the absence of an order restraining evictions, eviction had to happen. So the only question there that was left outstanding is the manner in which, in which this eviction was supposed to be conducted. Yeah. But you could also, a politician could also gain political dividend. Mm -hmm. Governor Avinia, if you had her utterance, said, no, this is not right. Yeah. You know, she's speaking to a political constituency that does not maybe have regard to the legal process because it's just fashionable to say, mm -hmm. you know what, don't evict. So I think politicians will weigh and see if there is momentum. I've seen, I've seen the Azimio leaders rushing there yeah, yeah, and expressing yeah, solidarity. Mm -hmm. So when the political divide, you know, get into the fray and take sides, the legal issues remain unattended to. And the legal issue is this. Are you occupying land whose title has been declared fraudulent? If the answer is yes, then it does not matter how politics go. But if politics were to influence the manner in which the, the, the eviction, then it would control mm -hmm. the manner in which the eviction happens. Because okay. I've seen part of this land now being again, uh, surprisingly... Under, under sale. You know, on sale. On sale, sale so, yes. so, so the question that then commends itself is that, shouldn't you just then have paused a bit? Instead of saying that the people who had these fraudulent titles would have drunk in priority and yet you've already demolished their houses, wouldn't you have just waited and then, you know, negotiated, listen, you are here illegally, your title is fake, that has been, that has been determined, but I want to give you the option of regularizing your title. Your title yeah. By now purchasing this property the right the way. Right way yeah. I think then it would make sense for them to pay twice than to, and, and save their homes than to demolish their houses and then ask them to pay twice and then start construction afresh. That and is I, where politics ought to have intervened yeah. to at least mitigate the kind of losses that we have now witnessed. This has happened before. It will not be the first time. I remember some time ago, maybe three, four years ago, in Comarok, there was, mm. um, there was massive evictions and they wanted to demolish those houses. But mm. someone said, wait a minute, if this is land that is available for sale, and you're evicting as well. We bought it 10, 15 years ago for some small money, but we've developed it. Why don't you give us an opportunity now to purchase it with remain without property? And that happened. It's not the only one. Um, somewhere in Tokimau, I know there are houses and there was fraudulent sale. And uh, the owners were given an opportunity to pay once more. So they paid double, but they still retain their yes, property. Yes. Mm. So it usually happened. So in this case, uh, looking at the fact that uh, uh, they are selling part of that land, they have demolished these houses, would you say that perhaps there was more, in terms of politics of that region and ownership and Mutuakukula Nini, and mm. obviously what is playing out right now? Mm. Would you, in your analysis? No, but I think also mm. it could also be a question of uh, posturing in court. Yeah, I think Ken, I'm a litigation lawyer. I'm yeah. living from from the practice of law, but I do not like my own cases taken to court because of the perils of litigation, heavily adversarial. It leaves people badly injured and bruised, and you don't want to negotiate. So it's always good mm -hmm. that when you have a case in court, you look at post-judgment strategies mm -hmm. and begin to anticipate. And I think lawyers owe clients a duty of um, you know, a balanced opinion that this case could go either way. And this is what it means for you if you lose this case. Mm. So you could overpromise that you're going to win this case, and then when you lose it, the client is left devastated. Mm. So if you think about post-judgment strategies, you can then begin to think, can we, as we determine the true ownership of this property, can we then begin to negotiate side by side an amicable settlement post-judgment? Mm -hmm. One that preserves the estate of the property 
the, the value of the, of the improvements thereon, while also giving the rightful owner the opportunity to recover the value. If the rightful owner says, you know, you must vacate, then you have no choice, you have to vacate. Have to but in, in this particular, I'm very disappointed that halfway into the demolitions, we see a notice giving priority to people whose houses have been demolished a chance to buy the same. I mean, it's, it's just not right. You know, sometimes what is, what, you know, what is right may not necessarily be what is legal. Of course, but what is legal is definitely right. But not everything that is right is legal. Yeah. Because what could be right in this particular circumstance is to show some magnanimity, some grace, and say, you know what? We have decided nonetheless there's a resolution, a board resolution that is disposed of this property, don't need it. So now that the question of ownership has been settled, do you want to purchase it? Because if you wish to purchase it, mm -hmm. then we can give it to you, give you a chance. Or if they don't want to, to sell it, I think we must be able to have some, some, some basic level of human consciousness, yeah? And to be able to say, although I can assert my rights forcefully, but it makes sense to tamper just with some, with some, sense, of, with some sense of fairness. So you say, I can give you a notice of six months, mm -hmm. but looking at the instances and the circumstances, children who live in those communities, now cannot go to school, yeah. they have no shelter, mm -hmm. churches have been demolished. Schools. I mean, you have disrupted life just because you want to protect a right which has been affirmed by the courts. Yeah. You could still protect your right, but could you give them multiple chances so that they have a, a decent opportunity to exit the premises if they want to, yeah. or if you know you want to sell it, give them a chance to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Having spoken about that extensively, Steve, we are where we are. Mm. What, what do these people, what is the recourse for these people? I mean, I am sure there was a notice that issued just before the evictions. I'm sure there was litigation and they were aware of everything. That I live in a community that everything that happens around, you are aware first time. Mm. You know what's happening. Mm. There's a road that needs to be made. There's a road that needs to be blocked. They were aware. So uh, probably everything you're talking about happened beforehand. They were given mm. a chance. They didn't believe it will happen. It will come to pass. We were told option to purchase it, right? Mm. They didn't see that passing, um, coming to pass. They kept on litigating. At some time, litigation has to come to an end. Mm. And then asserting of this uh, um, given rights must happen also. So what happens to these people? Is it time you walk away, count your losses, and say, you know, um, it is what I it is? I think they are... Right now, I mean, just this is speculative because I don't have the detailed facts, but mm -hmm. if I were to pontificate, they were, they were, they would, I would be, paint two scenarios. One, I mean, watching the manner in which these demolitions have been, eviction and demolition have been undertaken, one is almost persuaded to think that if they brought a class action claiming that the right to housing and education and shelter for the children have been violated in the manner in which the eviction happened, I think they would have, they would have a good case. But also, if the notices were served rightly mm -hmm. and they never took those opportunities, then maybe they could audit and find out who really dropped the ball. Is it the legal counsel? Because I would, I would not want to think that lawyers were complicit in this transaction that they actually they were not attentive to the procedures that we've discussed because it, be because, it, because it could expose the lawyers yeah it could for sure expose the lawyers mm -hmm. if i failed in my professional duty as counsel the duty of care to, to ensure that due diligence is conducted a client is relying on my legal advice and assistance and representation in this transaction and i drop the ball so casually i think they would have recourse so i think for now let fact turn on their own case. What I know is that we have to reach a level in this country mm. where even if somebody, somebody has been declared or gotten their title Steve, Steve, I'm told that your mic uh, has a small problem. So as I correct okay. it, mm. let me take you to Kisumu where a similar case. We are coming back to Steve because this is very important. The Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission has moved to court in a bid to recover 18 acres of Kibuye market land that's in Kisumu County. According to the commissioner's chief executive office, uh, that's uh, Officer Twali Mbarak, the parcels belonged to the market valued at about 2 billion shillings and had been allegedly grabbed by a private developer as Bramwell Buire reports.
The Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission is in court in a move aimed at recovering the grabbed Kibuye open-air market land belonging to the Kisumu County government. According to the Commission Chief Executive Officer Tuale Bumbarak, the land was grabbed and the grabber has been demanding 7 billion shillings from the county in order to release it back to them. This individual, he wants the county government to pay him a whooping 7 billion shillings claiming that this land belongs to him. So, ESEC, when we got this information, uh, we did our background uh, research, and we established that this market has actually been grabbed. Nahapa Kibuye is the hotbed of corruption. Kibinafsi, Eka, 18, 18 acres, into Moja, when we know that these 18 acres can be used by about 5 or 10,000 people, and where we want to find a the CEO further revealed that within Kisumu City, ESCC has recovered the Taifa Park land, which is valued at 500 million shillings, and several parcels of land belonging to the judiciary, valued at 950 million shillings. Bramwell Bwire, Kete News, Kisumu. Well, unending cases of uh, land grabbing or alleged land grabbing, that is a two billion land in the county of Kisumu. That land must be really big. Now, tonight we're getting advice that will have cost us a lot of money if we went to his law firm. Mm -hmm. But Steve Ogola is here to tell us exactly if these residents have recourse. And you're telling me that you don't believe the lawyers dropped the ball. And if they did? If they did, then they would expose themselves mm -hmm. to adverse litigation, which would be very unfortunate because... A lawyer is an expert in law. And if you take a transaction, there's a presumption that you believe you can handle it competently. And what is competent is not open for speculation. It's not about doing the right thing. It's about doing things the right way. Okay. You know, there's some um, a very curious, almost intimate connection between the way we organize our politics and the way we organize our personal lives. You'll be surprised that where Kenyans and politicians unite is in the results that what you care about is that I have a title deed. Mm -hmm. But we keep on saying the result is as important as the process. Yeah. If you do not pay attention to the process that is leading or giving rise or giving birth to your title, you could end up with a stillborn baby. And what do we do to stillborn babies? We have no option but just to discard right. them. Yeah. Unfortunately. That's where we are. So okay. the point that we cannot overemphasize today or tonight is that it's not enough to waive the sanctity of your title. It is enough you are required to waive the sanctity of your title and also accompany that title with a process that complied with every step of the way, a process that complied with the requirements every step of the way. And then if that process leading up to your title was presided over by an advocate, at the very minimum, can then that advocate will necessarily be called to question. That's why we have said, if we have, let me not call them impatient cl uh, clients, mm -hmm. but if you have ent uh, overly excited and enthusiastic, enthusiastic buyers who say, this property is so prime, I don't want to lose it, let's start by paying to lock it. Yeah. I think they need to sign an indemnity form that then protects the law firm or the legal counsel mm -hmm. from any kind of claim, because can. If someone comes to me and tells me, I want to do a cash purchase, again, it's sound legal advice, and I need to charge my legal fee. I will charge my legal fee, but I'll also give you a form to sign. Indemnity. Yeah. Just in that case. tells you that, listen, mm -hmm. you've assumed some risk because of how you trust this person. But this is the step that I've outlined for you leading up to the purchase of this land. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I've, I've rejected some of these transactions. And I've, clients have told lawyers, and including myself, that okay, the problem with this is that you don't know how to rush these things. We need someone chap chap. Mm -hmm. You know, people get titles in a matter of moments, but you are standing on the way. Mm -hmm. For instance, oh, what, you, better. what we've discussed: mm -hmm. if you are buying land from a land selling company, or from uh, from a, from a from a from a company, the title is in the name of a company. You need to pay attention to additional details. For instance, there must be board minutes and resolutions. To sell that property mm -hmm. and appointing certain persons will sign the sale agreement 
as authorized persons. Okay. Because the other shareholders... How do you verify that, Steve? That it's authentic? I can draft an they, MOU on behalf no, of my company and sell every, it unfriendly. You will get the CR12 of the company and mm -hmm. get everyone on the CR12 of all the shareholders mm -hmm. and directors mm -hmm. to swear an affidavit. Yes. And mm -hmm. they do so. Mm -hmm. We have done so. Okay. We that they are indeed our, aware uh, of yes, that Yes, yes, that they yeah. did, they have, they have sanctioned this transfer. Mm -hmm. And that the people who are signing this sale agreement on behalf of the company are actually the bona, bona fide yeah. shareholders of that company mm -hmm. acting in full authority. So that authority to act would be reflected in a sworn affidavit, sworn by all the directors. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes you do these transactions, you lodge the transfer, then it is the Minister of Land that tells you, we need the CR12 of the vendor. You didn't provide it. Mm -hmm. Then when you request the sale of the vendor, the vendor, the vendors, the sellers have pocketed the money. They are no longer picking your calls. Mm -hmm. But you can do a simple search in... You know, yeah. so even if you get the sale 12, mm -hmm. if they had not sanctioned the sale, now you would be at their own. mercy. You're on your own, yeah. So if you're buying property from, an, from a company, you need to be aware that there are additional requirements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would suggest in point form, the traditional format for buying property that can protect your title, the sanctity of your title is, first of all, do an expression of interest. Okay. I want to learn from you. I see you land have for this you. land, Steve. Yes. I want to buy land from you. Let them give you an offer mm -hmm. with some conditions. Okay. We are willing to sell you this yes. land and this is our condition for selling yes. this land to you. They will accompany that offer letter mm -hmm. with a copy of the title so you can do a search. The mother title, the yes. main title before yes. mutation. Then you do an acceptance, mm -hmm. then you negotiate the terms, yeah. then you go to drafting. Most of the time, the reality speaks different. People dispose of their property because they're in urgent need of cash. Or people buy property because they think it's too prime to lose. Mm -hmm. Or the deal is too sweet too to good, lose, too, too good. good to lose. Yeah, yeah. And if you start bothering them, put unquote, with these procedural technicalities, you know, provide mm -hmm. this, provide this, mm -hmm. they just switch lawyers. You stumbling block. But I think lawyers need to be need to be firm and need to insist that this procedure need to be complied with. Ken, in our law firm, we have bought properties for clients in all these various parts of the country, in Diani, here in Nairobi, mm -hmm. without any significant complaint. But I can tell you, the process has been painstakingly slow. Okay, it takes time. It takes it a takes lot of time. time. Yeah. And for me, as a litigation lawyer, I've wondered mm -hmm. how people who do conveyancing only. Mm -hmm. Celebrate conveyancing as because it's a very painful process. But, but it like, comes with a huge money. Yes, the huge, but, it comes with huge but money. But the pressure, the huge money. The pressure there is too much. Yeah. Because the due diligence, you mm -hmm. know, as in litigation, what we do, I take instruction, I go to court. Yeah. If you put me under pressure, tell you the court has given dates. Dates. I have, I have to, to wait. Go. But no. here, the due diligence is crazy. Okay. And you need to comply with them mm -hmm. if you need to be on the safer side. Okay. We are running out of time, but I need to ask this. I, I need to ask you for the red flags okay. while I'm purchasing a property. Before I ask you uh, other for your own red flags, tell me, in a, in a case where the, the um, buyer and seller use the same lawyer, is it a red flag that the lawyer acting for the seller is the same appointed lawyer working? So, sometimes it's coincidence, even law firms, right? The same law firm that was appointed because it's a property. Let me say it's a massive property under one developer, right? So the, 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 you find yourself using the same... Away to me, Advocate Wangu. The same lawyer acting for the buyer, this, I mean the seller, is the same one recommended by the seller to act for you as the buyer. Is it a red flag? I would say it's a red flag, though some lawyers would disagree, but I would say it's a red flag for the following reasons. The purchaser's advocate is supposed to issue a professional undertaking to the vendor's advocate. It would sound absurd that you issue that undertaking, the irrevocable undertaking, to yourself. Or to your law firm. Or to your own law firm. Yeah. That would be depressingly shocking. Mm -hmm. So I would not go that way. Again, if you are acting, if one lawyer is acting for both parties, he may have been introduced into this transaction by one of the parties. And he may inadvertently lean towards the other side, which could, which could compromise his vigilance. Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, completion date. Completion date sometimes is defined as the date when parties exchange documents. But yet completion date could mean the date when the purchaser has his title in his hand. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that is the time when he pays the balance. 
But if you say completion date is within 90 days from the date of signing the sale agreement, then you must release the balance to the, to the seller whether you have received the title or not. Oh, no. And yet you are acting. I mean, you just and if you are acting for both. So then, mm -hmm. it puts in a very ugly p position. I think personally I would discourage yeah. acting for both the vendor and the purchaser. Okay. The other problem which I see, mm -hmm. where developments, you have standard sale agreements, yeah? And you are told that we have a standard sale agreement and therefore it does not even matter that you have legal counsel. Because I've reviewed sale agreements where people are buying apartments mm -hmm. and I can see a clause that is obviously oppressive mm -hmm. to the buyer. To the buyer. Mm -hmm. But they'll tell you, no, 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 no. If you don't take it, there'll be someone else take it. Yeah. It's on demand. In those instances, I've said, you know what? Mm -hmm. This clause is oppressive. I've formed a professional opinion that I cannot lead a client mm -hmm. to buy this property. Based I'm not mm -hmm. saying that I don't trust the developer. It mm -hmm. look, they look reputable, but I'm saying mm -hmm. if there was a problem, I do not want to say that the reason why I overlooked this issue mm -hmm. is because the developer was reputable. Okay. And in those instances, we just said, no, we can't proceed with this transaction. Okay. So these standard sale agreements, mm. which apply for everyone, mm. if there's a large subdivision or maybe you're buying an apartment and everyone is signing on the same way, mm. using the same lawyer. Please look at it. And no, no, look at it mm. and have the presence of mind to say no if your lawyer has advised you mm. otherwise. Okay. The, the last red flag for you when someone is buying property that definitely would um, cause something like this. What would it be? From my practice experience, mm -hmm. if someone is selling, Buyers are always the most vulnerable ones. Someone is selling and tells you, no matter what happens, I want my money mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. In any event, I want that money paid within a, a specific period of 10 days or 15, 14 days or 30 days. Mm -hmm. That's a big red flag. Okay. That's a big red flag. Land is not something you... Dis I'm sorry to say this to Kenyans, yeah? Land is not something you dispose in a rush just because you need some money. Because you need to understand that there could be so many layers to peel that could, could impede your ability to fundraise quickly. Okay. Because if you say, I need, I need the cash price. Now, I'm going to give you my title. I will execute the transfer form. You can do a search. You have everything. Give me my money. Okay. The problem with those innocent sellers, let me call them, is that if somebody had fraudulently transferred the land without your knowledge as the original owner, mm -hmm. you could inadvertently complicate things for the new buyer. Yeah. And we've had instances where people have said, I have lived in this property in my life. 40 years. 40 years, mm -hmm. I'm selling it, everyone knows it's mine. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, and every time, you also did a search. You did a search on this property, how could I have known that somebody has a parallel title? But at that time, he's not refunding the money. Yeah, they're not refunding. If you are being pressed mm -hmm. to pay the full purchase price to the seller on signing of the sale agreement, or within a short period of signing the sale agreement, without a corresponding assurance that you'll get your title, I think that's a big red flag. Okay. The only assurance that you can get is that have this money then be held in a joint account by both councils. The vendor's lawyer, the seller's lawyer, mm -hmm. the purchaser's lawyer. Okay. You can put it in a joint account mm -hmm. or the purchaser's council can give you a, an irrevocable profession undertaking because that is as good as having money yeah. in your pocket. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and to explain that professional and take it the same thing when you you're buying for example a motor vehicle from yeah. uh, from uh, uh, a showroom mm. and you're buying it through loan uh, they likely release that car so long as they have a professional and taking from the bank. Once we finish this with Remy, yes, it's the yes, same thing that the same happens. Thing, yeah, sure. So mm. holding it in escrow. Thank you so mm. much, Steve. Unless you have so something much. to add no, 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 on I'm this. Happy, but it's also. an emotive issue as mm. always, land, and we'll always talk about it. So you guys send me and Pesa. I need to pay Steve <laughs> for all the professional <laughs> advice tonight. As I let Steve go, let's play the video of the week and I'll still take you to China and tell you exactly what President William Ruto did there. I know he's on, on his way, but first, let's take a look at the video of the week. Steve, you have seen that video of hustlers selling smokies and eggs and uh, whatever in town being harassed by Ascaris. I mean, people are trying to get by. Your comment on that, and I'll only give you about a minute because I have a story to run. On the issue of Brian Jaggi, you are a qualified 
lawyer you're an advocate i am not and i cannot uh, i cannot purport to be one so uh, your comment on that then your comment on brian let me start with brian's matter brian's fate is sealed by his own mischief sealed by his own mischief we have had lawyer we have had lawyers and non lawyers of argued cases without pretending to be advocates because an advocate is defined in law mm -hmm. You must have been admitted as such, and you must have taken out a practicing certificate. Honorable Okio Mtata routinely wins cases in court without having to characterize himself as an advocate. or hold himself as an, as an advocate. Mm -hmm. So Brian's fate is sealed. In as much as we sympathize with him, there is very little he can do. In fact, LSK will object to his admission as an advocate. Based on that? Based on that, yeah. and he would never really stand a chance of being admitted. Mm -hmm. On this video of the week, this is really sad because one word or two words, punishing poverty. What you have seen there, people trying to make a living and you are harassing them, it can only be described as punishing poverty. We need to be more attentive to our socioeconomic needs okay. and realities in this country that most Kenyans don't have and are not in formal jobs. And they need to go and sell their wares where people are. So we're not saying that we let hawkers work in a chaotic manner, mm -hmm. but we're saying that, listen, in as much as possible, create more room to allow them to access the buyers. Okay. That's all. Steve Ogola, advocate Asante Sana, and Asante. not advocate Muitu Asante Sana for coming. It's Asante. been a while since election. I haven't had you on the round Thank you. Asante. Looking forward to having Asante. more of these informative okay. discussions that are free pro bono on air. All right, let's move on. President William Ruto has